Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Q3 FI19 earnings conference call. I hope all of you would have received a copy of our results presentation. I would kindly urge you to go through this along with the disclaimer slides. We have with us today Mr. Sanjay Bahal, our Group CFO, Mr. Sanjay Behel, CEO of Lifestyle Business, Mr. Vipin Agarwal, President Corporate, Mr. Bibek Agarwala, CFO of Lifestyle Business, and Mr. Alpesh Dalal, Director of Corporate Finance. I will now hand over the call to our Group CFO, who will give you the summary of the results before we up, open up for Q&A. Over to you, Sanjay. Thank you, uh, Mukund, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today on this earnings call to discuss our results for quarter three, financial year 1819. At, at first, let me briefly discuss the prevailing market condition in quarter three, financial year 1819, for the industry as a whole. The quarter started with subdued retail demand, which progressively picked up with the advent of the festival season in early November. During the second half of the quarter, wholesale channel picked up for the upcoming wedding season in quarter four. In the apparel sector at the retail level, the offtake was relatively low in early October, which picked up with Diwali and the momentum was maintained due to the beginning of wedding purchases and the end of season sale, which started around mid of December. At an overall level, as the quarter progressed, after a slow beginning, the consumer demand improved towards the end of the quarter. Coming to our quarterly performance, I am happy to share that this quarter's performance is on track with growth momentum being maintained. The quarter witnessed growth across all our business segments. Our revenue grew by 13%, which is ahead of the guidance given in the last quarter, and EBITDA margins improved by 221 basis points, which exceeds the guidance given of 100 basis points improvement in the last quarter. Also, the underlying profit for the quarter at rupees 38 crores is up by 33% over the previous year. Let me take you through the revenue growth. The overall revenues grew by 13% with growth across all segments. A strong growth of 10% in branded textiles led by 13% growth in the suitings business on account of strong volume growth. There, there was muted growth of 2% in the shirting business, mainly on account of planned phasings and pipeline corrections. The volume growth in domestic business is driven by growth in the TRS and MBO channels on the back of fest festive season, coupled with growth in the exports in suiting business by 8%. The branded apparel grew by 20% with growth across all brands. We witnessed strong performance in Park Avenue with a growth of 21% and Park 17% and contribution from new customer segments. Also, there was strong performance in the MBO channel, which reflected a plus 29% growth, and an EBO channel 19% growth. The blended EBO same-store sales growth grew by 8%, reflecting strong secondary sales. The garmenting segment grew by 14%, led by exports in U.S. and Europe. High-value cotton shirting grew by 7%, led by yarn sales from Umravati plant. Engineering businesses continue to grow well, as auto component segment grew by 30%, driven by strong demand from both domestic and international customers. The tools and hardware segment grew by 2% due to better performance in exports. However, domestic was uh, uh, was was very slow. Overall commentary on EBITDA. The overall EBITDA equities 185 crores grew 41% over last year, driven by contribution from branded textile, branded apparel, and high-value cotton shirting segment. The EBITDA margin expansion of 221 basis points from 8.6% to 10.9% was led primarily by uh, the branded textile segment. The LTL EBITDA margin is higher at 15.6% as compared to 15.3% in the previous year, mainly due to top-line growth and lower discretionary spends. The reported EBITDA, which is post the common cost allocation, is 14.8%. In the branded apparel segment, the LTL EBITDA margins improved to 2.7% compared to 0.2% last year, mainly due to sales growth and better channel mix. The reported EBITDA margin is also higher at 2.2%. The garmenting segment, uh, in the EBITDA margin is lower at 3.8 versus 4.1 in the previous year. Excluding common cost allocation, the margin is higher by 50 basis points at 4.6%, mainly due to improvement in operating efficiencies. The high-value cotton shirting segment segment EBITDA margin is higher at 14% as compared to 10.7% in the previous year. The margin is higher due to improvement on account of product mix and stabilization of 
Amravati operations. The tools and hardware segment EBITDA margins improved to 11.8% versus 10.1% in the previous year on account of the execution of the turnaround strategy of building operational efficiency and product rationalization and improvement in the export margins. The auto component segment, uh, the EBITDA margin at 21.8% is lower versus the previous year by 260 basis points impacted mainly due to increase in raw material price. Overall, the business is maintaining its profitable sales growth momentum. A free cash flow was positive during the quarter at 94 crores. A cash flow from operations for the quarter was positive uh, at 226 crores, mainly due to improved business performance, as explained earlier. Gross debt stood at rupees 2610 crores as on 31st December versus 2428 crores last year, and the net debt was at 2185 crores as on 31st December versus 1988 crores last year. Our net debt levels increased this year mainly due to the manufacturing capex in the Ethiopia and Amravati plant and increase in working capital. Net debt to equity is stable at 1.1. The average interest cost increased by 54 basis points to 8.14% at Y2D level. On the working capital front, net working capital days at 102 days are marginally higher by one day versus the previous year. Our capex spend was 61 crores during the quarter, mainly related to retail expansion, new stores, uh, expansion of capacity in the auto component business, and maintenance capex in other plants. Now let me highlight the business initi initiatives undertaken during the quarter. In line with a stated asset light expansion approach in the core textile and apparel business, we opened 70 mini TRS stores under the franchise route during the quarter. Overall, till date, we have opened 209 mini TRS stores in 180-plus towns, largely in Tier 3, Tier 4, and Tier 5 towns. During the quarter, we have added five more franchise-based tailoring hubs, taking the total number of tailoring hubs to 38. This is in line with our stated strategy of facilitating quality tailoring services through tailoring hubs, which tailors the customer's requirements in quality-controlled environment. An update on the real estate project. We are happy to share that we have obtained project registration from Maharashtra RERA, which is the real estate regulatory authority pertaining to phase one of the total development of 20 acres of land for residential purposes. All the required regulatory approvals and in-principle approvals are in place. During phase one, we are developing two high-rise 42-story towers with two BHK apartments measuring 0.6 million square feet of saleable area. The project will provide world-class amenities and facilities which will reflect the benchmark of quality standards associated with Raymond. The project will be executed by experienced real estate teams supported by strong association partners such as Hafiz Contractor, who is the master architect, Epicon's consultants, Private Limited, who are the structural consultants, Godrej and Boyce, who are the green consultants, and Cracknell Landscape Consultants and others. We recently conducted the Bhumi Puja on 21st of January 2019 and will soon announce the launch of phase one of the project. I would like to reiterate that land monetization is a critical aspect in value unlocking at Raymond. Now coming to guidance for the fourth quarter. For Q4, with the advent of the wedding season, we are expecting the trade channel to grow and at the retail sector level, the positive consumer sentiments to be maintained. At the overall quarter level, we expect the growth momentum to continue due to end-of-season sales and the higher number of wedding days in the quarter. On the cost front, financial prudence and building operational efficiencies continue to be key focus areas. Also, from a branded tex textile margin perspective, with a continued increase in wool price, we have taken a price hike of 4% in January. Along with this price hike and other already undertaken initiatives of wool micron optimization and process optimization, we expect to part neutralize the impact of high wool prices. For quarter four, we are expecting high single-digit revenue growth and EBITDA margin improvement by 100 basis points over the previous year. Overall, to conclude, it has been a good quarter of strong revenue growth and improvement in margins. Thank you. We can now open for questions and answers. Thank you. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone wishing to ask a question may please press star in one on your touch tone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself in the question queue, you may press star into participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Chetan Falke from Alpha Invesco. Please go ahead. Good evening, sir. Uh, congratulations for a good set of numbers. Uh, sir, our quarter-on-quarter -quarter debt has not really moved up significantly, but our interest cost, our finance cost has moved up by 10 crores, I think from 60 crores to 70 crores. Uh, so can you just explain what has uh, happened over there and what should be the finance cost run rate going forward? Okay, so you're right that in this quarter the interest cost uh, reflects an increase of around 10 crores. Uh, so uh, what, what it includes is a provision of uh, 9.1 crores uh, which we have made uh, on account of uh, uh, potential interest costs which may come in due to deferment in the ULC payment that we have to make. If you recall some quarters ago, we had mentioned that uh, there is a total ULC uh, payment of 170 crores uh, that uh, uh, has to be made. However, we mm -hmm. secured uh, a deferment plan to, uh, to make this uh, payment. Uh, mm -hmm. Out of this 170, we have paid 42, and the balance amount has to be paid over the next uh, few quarters, uh, with the next one falling due by end of March uh, uh, 2019. So, uh, so on a conservative basis, we have provided for interest uh, of nine crore, which is really beginning from April onwards for the for the whole year till in December. Uh, going forward, we need to see whether, uh, as we can, as we make the ULC payments, these interest payments uh, will get regularized. Okay. So this okay. reflects the big shift that you are seeing really in interest cost. It, it, this is an account of this overall. Uh, I'm also happy to inform you that our interest costs at 8.1% are much lower than the benchmark uh, lending rates which are currently ruling at 8.5%. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on a normalized level, what should be the run rate we expect? Uh, we should expect in FY20? So uh, essentially 9 crores is the additional cost which has come in in this quarter. So uh, if, you, if you exclude this the at a... At a uh, 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 debt level which we have been able to maintain uh, and uh, the run rate should be really in line with the growth that we have. So essentially an account of increase on working capital. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, and sir, uh, coming to the real estate project, um, now we have announced only phase one which is 0.6 million square feet uh, and there are proposed five phases right, for this project. So right now only two buildings have come up but we expect 10 to 12 buildings to come up eventually, right? Yes, yes, that's the overall plan. That's the plan that has been approved. So right now we are beginning with phase one, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and we will, you know, uh, soon be getting into other phases gradually. Okay, so okay. okay. Any schedule and timeline for Sorry, phase two, phase three, three something? Okay. Uh, so maybe so what we are... Focusing now is on the launch of uh, phase one. As we come towards the launch, we'll be able to share more details with more clarity on what the other timeline for the other okay. phases will be as well. Okay. So last question is uh, 40, Sorry, usually the building is uh, 42 okay. floors. Uh, Ma'am, uh, this is just the extension of the question, just a second. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so the building is 42 floors and usually it takes four years, right, for the building to get completed. Uh, so, will we complete this phase one in the next four years and how are we scheduled when it comes to the uh, entire uh, you know, five phases of this project? Yeah. So, this is Vipin Agarwal, the site. I am taking care of the reality project. So, so hmm. far as the data guidelines are concerned, it is a, the period of five years is applicable to each project we announce and each tower is a project as per radar technical terms. Hmm. So, as and when we keep adding, you know, whatever phase of time it is, the five-year period is going to be applied from that date. Okay. Got it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all participants in this conference, please limit your questions to two per participant only. The next question is from the line of Dikshit Mittal from Shipcom Ventures. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening, sir. Uh, so my question is on this uh, 9 crore additional interest payment. So uh, will this be recurring till you make this ULC payment or uh, this is the one time in this quarter only? So this is a provision that we have made for the, the past uh, interest which has accrued. On a recurring basis, uh, this will keep declining as we keep making the payments.
Okay, so so this provision is for which period? This is for provision is uh, for the nine months of the year. Okay, so so uh, so in case there is a delay in this payment, so this uh, this can recur in next quarter as well, right? Uh, on a quarterly basis. On a uh, quarterly basis, it, it 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 is it is yes, the approval will be there. So three crore uh, uh, quarterly that we can take till this payment. Three crore, yeah. Okay. Uh, and so secondly, uh, we have seen sequential dip in the garment uh, uh, segment a bit. So is it, is there any one-off or is it uh, this seasonality uh, involved in this segment? No, it's, uh, <clears throat> on garment thing, uh, just could be the phasing, the way the product is really got phased out. So, uh, plus there is Ethiopia as it is building up, that could be the blended impact of that. Um, uh, but you would see on an average, there would be an improvement in a bit for the year. Uh, by about 150 to 200 basis point in our commenting business. Okay, because uh, last two three quarters we we were at seven odd percent kind of a beta. Now uh, this quarter we have fallen to around uh, below four. So that's why I ask you, uh, what is the sustainable uh, beta margins in this segment? So it's about eight percent is what we had given in guidance in last year. Okay. Uh, okay. About five, seven to eight percent, and that uh, should get restored. Back. Okay. And sir, so lastly in this. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Mittal. Okay, I'll, I'll get back into you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The next question is from the line of Govindlal Gilada, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Hey, yeah, yeah. Good afternoon to all, sir. Uh, Good afternoon. I, I have got a few questions on real estate. Eh? Uh, earlier, one of my colleagues was asking about this uh, first phase. Eh? I want to understand, sir, net net 20 acres we are talking about, we are giving guidance 3 million square foot will be developing in five years. So that was, uh, I am wondering, uh, this first stage itself will take at least four years. So uh, generally 40 floors, it takes four years to complete. So this 3 million will be able to complete whole 20 acres in five years, what we are guiding? Uh, I think just now we talked about it. So this five year period is applicable as per RERA guidelines and it is applicable from the tower which you already start constructing. So assuming that we start constructing the next tower, say, you know, after six months, so five-year period will be applicable from that date. So no, no, I understand. Five, no, no. I am asking about total guidance. What we have given 20 acres, we will complete 3 million in five years. That's what I am asking. We will be able to complete 20 acres, 3 million in five years. So five years has to be read from the date in which each project, which is the each tower, is starting its construction. So uh, to answer uh, your question, Mr. Gilada, we, uh, yes, uh, we have said that the project will be a five-year project from the date we announced the project. Now, the project, as far as RERA is concerned, is a, as we announce the towers, that is considered as a project. And there is five years from that date, as the has explained. So, uh, so that really, if we had all launched all the 3 million square feet at the same time, then it would be five years. But since we are going to launch it at different times, uh, uh, which is more prudent uh, uh, in terms of planning and execution perspective, uh, it will be five years for each project. Oh, yeah. Now it is more clear. Uh, earlier it was confusing, 20 acres, 3 million, 5 years, something like yeah, that. Guidance like the that. So that it all gets launched on the, at the same time. However, it is more prudent given the uh, market that we launch it in a phased manner. Yeah, yeah, understood. So uh, we can't take care of face value that 20 acres will be completed in 5 years, 3 million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, hello? Yes, go ahead. Uh, 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 sir, uh, overall, what is dynamic, sir? Now, anyhow, we have got permission. We are launching project also. In last few con calls, I was asking. Uh, I have been told that uh, whenever we launch, we'll give all uh, further information. So I want to know what kind of average relation we are expecting, cost of construction, all that, government cost, what we'll incur, what will be PBT for this project. Anything can you share on this economics, sir? How much debt we have to take for uh, development of this project? Okay. So, so I think you have a number of questions on this. So far as we are concerned, the launch is actually going to be divided into parts. You know, first there is a soft launch, which we are going to do, you know, a little bit of a uh, market experimentation and to discover the price. So we will possibly be in a position to kind of address the questions in much more specific details by end February. And I think there is a plan to host uh, another call in detail to discuss the questions which you're talking about. Uh, Pallar, sir, what, what kind of cost of construction will occur? Any, any other uh, dynamics can you just share as well? Government cost, cost of, what will enter? Sir? Cost of construction is also something which is uh, a, a little bit of a standard calculation which can be made, which is comparable with the industry trends. Also, there is a possibility of doing some value engineering, which we are in the process of working out. 
So possibly, you know, give us a month's time, we'll be in a position to share better details with you. Okay, further, any date we'll be raising for this project, sir, over and above regular date? No, the, as you, I suppose you're referring to the launch? Yeah, yeah, for this project what we are launching. Eh? So any further date we have to reach for this? Thing? Yes, okay, you're asking for date. Now, uh, so so we, we, uh, we've already spent about 150 crores uh, by up to quarter three. Over quarter four, we expect uh, with the approvals that have to be paid for, while we have secured the approvals, the statutory payments have to be made. Those, along with other launch expenses, should total around 100 crores. Uh, post this, for phase one, we do not expect any further uh, uh, any further debt or, uh, or to be raised for this. It should be self-financed. Uh, let us say uh, another oh, hundred crores. Uh, yes. So there's last, yes. last. That's right. That's right. That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. That another hundred crores of very potential expenditure. Very conservatively speaking. Yeah. After that, it will be all set finance because we would be launching it commercially. So the sales, revenues, etc., will collections, etc., will start, and uh, the construction expenses will be largely into construction. So it should be self financed. Who is contacting Sorry for to our interrupt, Mr. Gilada. Excuse me, sir. This is the operator. Oh, okay, I'll come back in. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Zain Iqbal, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. So, uh, I have a question on suiting. So, we have taken a price increase of 5%, uh, so versus the usual 2 to 3%. So, can you please share if this is mostly to cover cost of wool and discourse or possibly to improve margins given the strong uh, betting season ahead? Yeah, so the uh, overall momentum, as you see, has been pretty good. In domestic suiting, we're looking at double-digit growth continuing in the year on a YTD basis and the quarter. So uh, we thought that we have enough momentum now to also partly neutralize the wool cost. So the primary trigger for an exceptional price increase beyond our normal 3 to 4% a year, for us to have gone at about 4 to 5% depending on blend, is largely on account of input cost and our ability with this kind of momentum to pass it on. Also augured or facilitated by the wedding season ahead. So I think there were multiple factors to time this price increase, which is what we've done now, and it is largely to take care of the input costs. Okay. So my second question is on uh, the innerwear category. So what's the strategy on uh, the innerwear? Because Van Usen is the number two player in, in currently in India, and they've already crossed the uh, 100 crores of sales, and they target to do 200 in FI19. So what's our game plan? Yeah, so in a way, this uh, category is actually further getting segmented into two fundamental segments. One is the jockey equivalent briefs, trunks, and vests, which is called the BTV segment. And the second is the loungewear, athleisure, nightwear kind of a category. So there are the sleepwear kind of category. Yeah? So there are two fundamental things, whereas Van Huysen has started playing on both, as we are aware. Uh, it's a category where we already have some representation through Park Avenue, which is sizable, so about... Uh, close to about 30 crores of our revenue comes from Innovair, largely coming from Park Avenue as a brand. Uh, we have additional offerings under Color Plus also in the Innovair segment there. Uh, we are yet to really have an aggressive standalone Innovair acquisition. We are evaluating multiple opportunities in Innovair. The only, uh, I think, aspect you also need to, while it's number two, it's number two only in premium branded innerwear segment. That's what Van Oizen is. There is a very large segment of mass innerwear brands which are multiple times bigger than uh, most of the uh, other branded players at this point of time. So from Raymond perspective, we are evaluating should it be a brand play in terms of extension or should it be a standalone innerwear play? This juncture, we don't have a clear distinction or a decision on that. We will continue to uh, grow in our innerwear segment as branded extension of Park Avenue and Color Plus that we have at a rate of about 15-20% CAGR, which we've been getting. Going forward, if there is any change in strategy, then we'll announce it at a suitable time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Tejas Lakhani from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Congratulations on a good set of numbers. Uh, two questions. One is that uh, on on the intent of uh, the management uh, to hive off certain non-core uh, assets, uh, are we anywhere in the process? So we've stated our strategic intent to uh, uh, hive off non-core to deleverage our balance sheet, bring down debt. I think that though that effort is uh, uh, continuing. 
Uh, however, it's, it's difficult to give you timelines on this, but uh, we reiterate our strategy and we continue to pursue that path. Okay. So as, uh, of, sorry. As and when we get the right opportunity for unlocking value, we will certainly be, we will certainly uh, be prepared to do that. Okay. And uh, on the second part, uh, do you have, uh, I mean, I wanted to understand that the total land that you all hold in Thane, uh, part of it you all had also said that from a deleveraging perspective, you will be finding a strategic buyer for a small portion of, of the land. So am I correct in my understanding? And what is the portion of land that you all are looking to sort of sell? So, uh, so we have two stated strategies on real estate. One is that we've announced our a project uh, to develop 20 acres, 3 million square feet of land. The other is that we have also stated our intent to sell smaller parcels of land. Uh, so efforts are on in that direction as well. So what would be the quantum? Yeah, so smaller parcel, I mean, it could be uh, 20 acres of land, uh, it could be 10 acres of land. So, so efforts are on, uh, on towards that. And from a deleveraging perspective, are you are you foreseeing any of that to take place in in F20 or uh, or it could get further deferred? It depends on uh, the right value and uh, uh, the opportunity coming in, so that we strike a win-win deal. Uh, however, it's difficult to put a timeline. Ideally, yes, we would like to see it happen sooner rather than later. Okay, and just to slip Sorry, one last question is, yeah, I, I know. I'm, uh, I'm, sir, we request yeah. that you return to the question. Yes, sir, yeah, it's, just one, it's just one last follow-up. Sir, uh, there are thanks. participants waiting for their turn. I okay. request you to return to the question. Thanks. Please. Okay, sure. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is in the line of Abhishek Roy from Stewart and Mactage. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, sir, and congratulations on good set of numbers. Uh, sir, my question is uh, regarding the real estate development. Uh, sir, can you just share what is the JV agreement uh, for this uh, housing project? Okay. Excuse me, JV. Yeah, I don't know what is the source of information on JV. Uh, as per our knowledge, we are developing it ourselves, and we have got a uh, you know absolutely top class team which is taking care of it along with partnerships with equally reputed uh, vendors and agents. So you are saying that there won't be any profit sharing or anything, like it is completely taken by yourself, right? Yes, as of now it is, it is so structured like this. Okay. Okay. Are you referring to the development management uh, company by any chance? Uh, sorry? Okay. And sir, uh, regarding uh, one more point that you mentioned that uh, rest of the land bank you, will, you are planning to monetize. So can you just all mention the time frame for that? I just mentioned in the last question, my answer was that we would like it to happen sooner rather than later. However, it is, it is difficult to put a timeline because it, it requires uh, the right valuations, etc., to, to, to come and to be offered and to conclude a potential deal. Uh, it's difficult to put a timeline. The intent is certainly there. That given the right valuation, we would be certainly willing to look at it. So that will be uh, like a similar kind of uh, housing development projects or any development or simply the no, land? That will people be, be looking for selling the land, as I said. So the development uh, is, is what we've announced, which is 20 acres of development. The rest of the land that we are seeing as of now is to, the intent is to, sm to sell smaller parcels. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. The next question is from the man Abhijit Kundu from Antic Shop Broking. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the, this side, Varun. Uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity, sir. Uh, just two questions. One, uh, sir, despite uh, third quarter being uh, festival season heavy compared to second quarter, uh, uh, why do we see you know decline in EBITDA margin in almost all the segments? So branded, I mean sequential decline in branded apparel. So it declines from 3.2 to 2.7 in textiles, 15.9 to 15.6. Uh, even in high value certain segments, so we see 16.2 to 14.8 percent margin decline. So, sir, can you please explain? Uh, I mean, what would be, uh, what's possibly the reason? So, uh, it's purely a mixed issue and seasonality issue. If you see, last year third quarter had a reasonably high number of weddings there, and this this year the number of wedding dates were less than half of last year same quarter. So, wedding has a direct elasticity with high value, high ASP product and high margin products. 
So part of the reason is really while the festivities were still there, as you said, uh, uh, more in quarter two, which were very similar to what was there in quarter two, it's purely the deferment of wedding season from quarter three to quarter four. So you would see a bump up in a sequential margin in uh, quarter four versus quarter three. What would be the roughly contribution from wedding and uh, festival? I mean, roughly uh, any idea on an annual basis? This is different businesses have different contributions. So shooting has a higher correlation with that. Shooting will have a relatively lower correlation with that. Formal clothing will have higher. Casual clothing will have lower. So it's very difficult to give you one blended answer because different categories have different elasticity. But on a blended level, if you see, even at a business level, there is a direct correlation, which happens with wedding. So different businesses have different kind of a thing. It could be go as high as uh, 35% sales happening in 25% time in a quarter if the weddings are good. It could go as low as 17% if there are no weddings. So it just swings that, that kind of range. Sure, understood. And the second question is, sir, what would be your KPIs guidance for uh, FY20? FY20, next year. Yeah, yeah, so next year, as, as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, that, you know, we've given guidance which was uh, which was in our investor presentation. We stick with the uh, with those guidance. Specifically, uh, when we come to the end of quarter four, and uh, we will be giving you the annual guidance for financial year 20. As of now, uh, the guidance we had given uh, for financial year 20 earlier still holds. Understood. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the lion of Mithul Mehta from Lucky Investment Managers. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you, uh, uh, you know, the previous uh, question was on the capex, which you did mention that you know you would elaborate uh, during Q4 call. But uh, just to get a little, uh, you know, sense on your Amravati and uh, Ethiopia, because they were contributing large part of the capex and that apart you know store additions and uh, furniture and fit out so uh, your amravati are we kind of completely uh, invested in amravati and ethiopia so far or not yes, yet so in, in amravati we are fully invested almost 95 percent investment is through and we are running uh, broadly at about uh, broadly at about 100 percent efficiency in fact in the last three or four quarters and uh, uh, and the only thing which is left is possibly some flow of capex, which will be just optimization capex of some line balancing, uh, some boiler related last touches, about 20 odd crores is left in a project which was about 250 crores worth. Other than that, most of the capex is behind us. So that is our number of a thing. In terms of productivity efficiencies, we are doing better than what we had initially projected. We are running a little ahead of our own internal targets there. This is a plant which is running at almost 100% efficiency. In fact, in the opening, uh, remarks, Sanjay did mention that uh, there has been a huge upside uh, on Amravati, which has led to a significant improvement in our margins from close to from 10.5% to going to close to 15% for the quarter. Largely is on the back of excellent uh, performance by Amravati plant. The other point of Ethiopia that you mentioned, we are running about six months of a lag because there has been some civil unrest in the country for which there has been a uh, some precautionary measures taken by the government and there is some travel advisory issues to some of our customers there. So we've deferred. We had a plan to run eight lines of jackets and suits there. We have invested only six till now. The plan was to invest eight. We have deferred about eight, uh, uh, two lines and that's about 25 crores of capex on a 130 crore project has been deferred. The rest has been fully invested. Uh, and that deferment has happened purely because we need to fill, uh, get the volume and the demand underwritten before we invest in the capacity. So that would now get deferred staggered over the next five or six quarters. At this point of time, we're running six out of eight lines, and that 105 out of 130 crore of bitta. And uh, our production is a little lower than our earlier estimates. So we're running at anywhere ranging between, depending on the product category. So on trousers, we'll be at about 55, 60% of our capacity, where waistcoats, we'll be running more than our capacity that we had done. So uh, currently, there is still a lot of balancing of capacity happening. The maturing of Ethiopia capacity will happen two quarters from now, where we'll so, start coming closer to our estimates. Yeah. So, sir, is it fair to assume that, uh, you know, you, you would be running flat out in Amravati very soon, and Ethiopia also, once you put those two balancing lines there also, you know, you will start running uh, flat out based on your order bookings and all. So, which means that you will have to invest further in these two assets. No, there doesn't seem to be, because there is enough sweating which is possible with the current assets there. 
Amravati pretty much flat out will happen, as you rightly said. It's already running at that kind of a capacity, so it will start peaking pretty much in the next year in terms of our efficiencies of that plant. Ethiopia still has some way to go. So if you if you really understand the operations of a garmenting plant, it takes about six weeks after a line is put up, six quarters after a line is put up, for it to come to true optimal productivity. We started this plant somewhere in the middle of last year. So June 2018, we commissioned this plant. We still sixth quarter of its running right now, but we have staggered the capacity in different quarters as we go. Uh, and as and when the lines come, it takes six quarters for it to, to come close to its optimized level. So I think that Ethiopia will have a lot more still in the next four to six quarters in terms of additional efficiency yet to be obtained, while Amravati will start hitting its peak pretty much in the next year. But sir, do you have enough uh, land? Oh, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Mehta. Uh, last question, if you may, please. Okay, uh, good. Sir, do you have enough uh, land available in Amravati uh, to yes, we do. beef up the we? infrastructure there? We have a very large parcel of industrial land there. We have close to 500 acres of land, of which we are only utilizing 35 acres at this point of time. So, which means it is all brownfield, basically, incrementally. Yeah, it could be. It has to be brownfield as we go ahead. We have enough land parcel there. And how much would be maintenance? In terms of capex? Yeah, every year. Largely, it's maintenance now because there is hardly any expansion which is planned in the next four to six quarters. Right? We don't see that. So, next four to six quarters, if you see our uh, capex, even including this year, it's largely been maintenance now, capex. Okay, so it will be roughly to the extent of depreciation. Uh, it will be a little under. The retail part it also comes in there. There is some right. retail expansion also comes in. So, it is a little lower than the depreciation. You like. So, okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Arjun Sehgal from Reliance Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good evening and congrats uh, for a good result. So my question was uh, regarding the branded apparel segment. So uh, this December quarter was uh, a festive quarter. So uh, I mean, uh, one was probably expecting this to be a, a, a bigger quarter for branded apparel in terms of revenue versus Q2. So uh, that is not the case. I just wanted to understand uh, how come, why is that so? As in, you did 484 crores in, of revenue in Q2, and we have 397 in Q3, which is about 20% lower. So just wanted to understand why this is the case when it was a festive quarter. No, this is a good, exactly. I keep coming back to the same thing. There, there, is, there are two specific elasticities to our business. One is festivity, one is weddings. And... Uh, for us, they, they have... Q2 had a lot of wedding dates, is that what you're saying? Q2 had a lot of wedding dates. Had a lot of festivity, which is equal to what it was, but had much lower wedding dates in quarter three. So quarter four will be again a larger quarter, because the number of wedding dates in quarter four are much higher than they were in quarter three. That's the reason. Okay. And yeah, that, it's really about... Uh, because we have two large brands, Park Avenue and Raymond, which are directly yeah. correlated to the wedding part of it, So, which is about 65% of my portfolio is really on the... So called formal kind of heavy weighted there, which has a very direct correlation with that. Sure. And uh, second question was on the general consumer sentiment and uh, the buying patterns. Anything that you would like to highlight? Is there sluggishness or any 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 pertinent point you would want to talk about? Uh, October was a little lukewarm, and uh, I think that was also covered in the opening statement. But we've seen some pickup in consumer sentiment moving uh, in the months of November and December. It's also got hugely aided by uh, deep discounting, which has happened in the e-commerce towards the end of October, running towards November. That's also augured to some level of additional consumption, which would have gone in. Uh, we haven't seen much of a slowdown, actually, post-December, while the end-of-season sales started middle of December. For most of the players uh, continues to uh, fuel uh, the consumption, and we've seen now that weddings have already set in from 15th of January. Uh, last week, we are seeing only the demand uh, continues to be pretty high. So we feel that as we're getting into elections, as the uh, overall sentiment continues to be positive, aided partly by some discounting, which is fueling it, both in terms of offline, uh, also augured by some uh, hostile e-commerce kind of, you know, uh, uh, policies in terms of, uh, or draft at this stage, which are saying that, you know, by end of February or end of March, they need to liquidate a certain kind of stock there. So there seems to be some additional level of incentive which has been given by most of the branded players, which is also fueling a little bit of a demand. So combination of some positive consumer sentiment and artificially created discount-led trigger demand, we feel that quarter four is going to be a reasonably high quarter for most of the branded actual players. Sure, sir. Thank you. That's it for my side. Yeah. Thank you. Next question is from Ashwin Sharma from Reliance Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. 
Thank you. The next question is from the line of Yash Gupta from Prince Group. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, sir. One of your questions is that how our denim business is competitive with the Bangladesh products and the Pakistan products. Is that we have any advantages in this? And the second question is this, as the cotton price... I think your voice is getting muffled up. I'm not able to hear. I think uh, uh, you're on a mobile. Is it, are you asking about denim business competitiveness versus Bangladesh and Pakistan? Uh, yeah, sir. Yeah, correct, correct. Denim, okay. So, uh, so yes, uh, a denim business uh, currently is uh, impacted uh, by a couple of uh, points uh, and issues. One, of course, is the overcapacity that the business is facing uh, in India. Uh, and the other is the high cost of cotton. Uh, and when you look at uh, the competitiveness of Bangladesh, and Pakistan, uh, yes, uh, the businesses in India are at a relative disadvantage. Pakistan, one, because of the rupee depreciation that has happened in Pakistan, so it makes their export competitive. Uh, the other is also the prices of cotton is lower in Pakistan. Uh, Bangladesh, the garmenting uh, costs are, are much lower. They are able to offer full package and treaty benefits that they have uh, with U.S. Uh, customers. So that is aiding them. Uh, in, in exports uh, from Bangladesh. So yes, uh, currently the industry is at a relative disadvantage. Our, our business, uh, from our business perspective, a lot of measures are being taken to, uh, one, to offer full package solutions, uh, to augment our garmenting uh, capacity by outsourcing it, and also to really to move up the value chain. I think that's the big step that we are doing is to is to launch product innovations which uh, go higher up in the value chain so that what in terms of design and in terms of product, so we are able to actually effectively give a better quality product over what the competition can give. So there is a lot of uh, in, 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 uh, effort which is going on into design and innovation of products. Okay. And the second question is that as the cotton pricing is uh, varying too much, uh, volatility is there, do we have any option to hedge that particular uh, cost of raw material for us? So we look at all these options uh, in terms of what's the best course of action. There are uh, there are commodity exchanges which are available. We've looked at those in terms of is it a strategy that we need to take to 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 take a hedge. Uh, there is a cost to the hedge as well, and sometimes our evaluation shows that it's better to uh, not to take these derivatives uh, which can backfire in the long run. So it's a, but it's a constant uh, your uh, uh, evaluation that we do. So given the, given the forecast of cotton and given the cost of hedging, we will certainly we keep looking at these uh, these models. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ritesh Bhagwati from Rockstar Capital. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my question pertains to real estate. Uh, so, my question is like, uh, do you think it's a wise decision to not pay the debt, which is roughly around 2200 crores, by uh, for by selling the land and instead rather getting into this reality business, which I believe it's a non-core business for a company like Raymond, which again, we believe it's a high gestation of five years as we have already discussed. And again, for that, we need to have another debt of 200 to 25 crores. So, why such kind of a decision uh, the management of Raymond has taken? So, that was my first part of the question, if you can answer. Okay, so let me take that on. I think we've answered that in earlier con calls as well. Uh, we have stated our policy is to monetize our land. Monetization can happen in two ways. Either we wait for uh, sale of the land uh, or we look at uh, developing a parcel of land, which uh, we believe uh, will give us uh, higher returns as well. So we've engaged in now uh, uh, both the dual strategy. We uh, we have announced our plans to monetize a small parcel of land up to 3 million square feet. We believe that it will be cash flow positive, it will be cash accretive. Uh, yes, we have to spend on uh, the approvals uh, and, uh, and the cost of uh, securing these approvals. However, uh, post this uh, with higher sales velocity, we believe that the project is going to be cash flow positive. The effort continues. Uh, it's not an either-or scenario that if you are developing, we will not sell. We will continue to put in efforts to uh, sell the other parcels of land, smaller parcels of land, and, uh, and efforts uh, to, uh, uh, to, to do that continue. And that uh, is uh, clearly our intent to uh, use the 
cash flows from there, from sale to deleverage the balance sheet, reduce our debt, etc. So that will continue. Okay. My other part of question is like there are other non-core segments like auto and industrial, which I have seen across the years have done way better against last three four years. But then uh, still we are unable to exit those businesses. Like why is that happening? Are we like expecting high kind of valuations for the exiting or what is it exactly? I think it's a fair value that we expect. We've turned these businesses around. Right. Uh, it does take time to see that uh, uh, we have the right fit for these businesses, the right opportunity has to come along. These are things which can happen very quickly or it can take some time. So uh, uh, what we are currently engaged in is in the process of one which we have successfully achieved is to turn these businesses around and to uh, to generate uh, positive cash flows from these businesses, to uh, uh, generate high return on capital employed from these businesses. I think that objective has been achieved. The other is to then see as to where would these businesses have a great strategic fit and what would be the right valuation for these businesses. So we are engaged in this process. It may take some time, but uh, but there is no desperation that we have on exiting these businesses. Yes, we are. Uh, the, the, the single focus that we have is what enhances shareholder value. Right. And we will take the right decision when it comes to that. Okay. Thanks for taking my question. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Ashok Shah from LSE Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my question is pertaining to the realty sector only. Uh, sir, as I understand, uh, our Raymond complex is situated in the more than 100 acre area with school and the uh, promoter group company also. So, are does the uh, promoter group companies also developing or are we developing our uh, realty project with the promoter group company land or what's the situation? No, let me clarify, the uh, 120 acres of land is with Raymond and the project that we have announced uh, of 3 million square feet uh, covering 20 acres of land is, uh, uh, is land under Raymond Limited. So remaining 100 acres remains with the uh, promoter group or is it still with the uh, Raymond group, uh, Raymond company? No, 120 acres is Raymond Limited. Okay, so uh, there is a land of uh, promoter group company also. That is 20 acres of land, which is uh, which is uh, 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 in which Raymond also has a 47.8 percent stake, which is uh, JKIT. Yeah. Okay. So that is the remaining so, 20 acres is with JKIT. So okay. So we are developing 20 acres, and that is on the metro side, or it's uh, inside our school near the school area. It is. Uh, uh, it is. It is uh, on. Uh, 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 on the Pokhran Road, uh, uh, number one side. Okay, not. So, do we project the land on the uh, uh, this uh, Gorbandar Road or the metro where the metro is being constructed? Can you repeat your question, please? No, my question is regarding the do we uh, out of 100 acres we are developing 20 acres on the Pokhran Road. So, we road still number two. Yeah. Pokhran Road number two. So, we have got two access points. One is Pokhran Road number one. Yeah. Is Pokhran number two. Okay. So, Pokhran Road number two is where we are developing this, and there is also a new school which is coming up alongside in the same site. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sagar Dhawan from Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I, I had a couple of questions on, inner, on the innerware segment. So, uh, I wanted to ask you whether you manufacture the innerware uh, products in house currently or uh, is it outsourced? It's 100% outsourced. It's outsourced, okay. And is it uh, outsourced out of India? Is it, is it coming from some other country? No, it's almost 99% of that is coming within India. Ouch, okay. 99% is from India, okay. And about the distribution of innerware, so is, is the product being retailed currently to own through own EBO outlets or is it through like a, a drug jockey, like the third party distribution? So we have about 1,500 multi-band outlets through which we distribute it beyond Raymond shops and EBOs. All three channels okay. are being used, exclusive band outlets, uh, multi-band outlets, and our LFS, all the three channels, and Raymond shops, all of them are being used. Okay, and are you selling it online currently? Yes, it's available online. Online as well, right. And in terms of total touch points, uh, how many touch points would the, would the innerware product be reaching currently, uh, apart from 1,500 MBOs which you uh, spoke about? So about 13, we have a 1,365 EB, uh, EBOs, uh, uh, which is beyond the 1,500 MBOs. That's combination of Raymond shops and exclusive brand outlets. 
of which about 1200 of them will be adequately stocked with it and beyond that there will be about close to about 3 to 400 large format retail doors which will have it so a fair estimate would be that beyond 1500 ebos there will be close to about 2000 other touch points which will have our in a way okay got it sir thank you and uh, one more question do you have your own distribution platform like do you have third party you know like for distributing to the mbos have you tied up with uh, 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 distributors yes we have we have uh, uh, large distributors for apparel distribution to multi brand uh, channel and okay. uh, there are about they, they are present in all the states in the country okay how many distributors would that be uh, currently which you are tied up with 26 or so 26 okay Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Chetan Falke from Alpha Invesco. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity again. Uh, sir, uh, what percentage... Uh, my question is regarding branded apparel. So, in branded apparel, what percentage of our revenue is coming from bottom wear and what percentage is from shirts or T-shirts? Do we have that sort of a breakup? And how it is evolving for us over the last two, three years and how it will evolve over the next uh, few years. Yeah, so bottom wear would be uh, less than 5% of the brands that we represent. So I told you that six, Park Avenue would be close to about 600 crores and 30 crores of being aware there. Shirts uh, typically ends up being a large segment. Now brand by brand, these numbers are very different because in color plus t-shirts would be far higher or casual segment would close to be 85 to 90% and formals would be much lower there. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas in Raymond, it will become actually suits uh, and jackets will be probably become the number one segment there. So mm -hmm. typically you would find close to about 25 to 30% of our revenues are coming from shirts. About 15 odd percent at a blended level I'm saying would be coming from jackets. About 15 to 20% would be coming from trousers and the rest, 30% will be distributed on all other product categories. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's it from there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Dikshit Mittal from Shipcom Ventures. Please go ahead. So my question is on uh, associates. Uh, we have seen uh, loss from associates widening in this quarter. So is it more to do with denim business or uh, or many other businesses also making losses? Yeah, so the denim business, uh, uh, primarily denim business, uh, which was impacted, as I said, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier in the call. Uh, there has been a, a, a positive contribution from our FMCG business as well, which is performing, uh, which I'm happy to report that it is uh, uh, growth of uh, close to 35% year on year. But uh, yes, the impact is uh, uh, on, on denim. Because because last two, three quarters, denim had actually uh, broken, you know. So is, is the interesting edition deteriorated during this quarter or is it one? Sorry, could you repeat that? Sir, if I see the trend, last two, three quarters, uh, this business seemed to have broken you know, on, in terms of denim. But this quarter yeah. again, uh, we have uh, reported loss. So is the industry phenomena or uh, any particular one-off in this uh, quarter? Yeah, I, I, clearly this is uh, uh, the in industry and sector issue. There, there is overcapacity and uh, unfortunately the cotton prices which were expected to soften uh, uh, are not uh, uh, behaving the way as it has in the past. Uh, the MSPs have been announced and as a result the cotton prices are ruling firm. Whereas in in US and in other parts of the world, cotton prices are actually lower than in India. So we've actually turned at a disadvantage as far as the export market is concerned. That clearly has happened over quarter three. The first half of the year, you're right, uh, the business has done much better. Uh, so we are now uh, looking at how do we overcome these challenges. And uh, I mentioned a few initiatives that uh, I spoke about earlier in which we are taking. Okay. And sir, uh, lastly, uh, uh, in terms of wool prices, sir, what is the current trend like as compared to last quarter? So what is the extent of rise in the prices? It's holding up to last quarter. I think we saw a massive increase uh, in the first half. <coughs> so wool had gone up to uh, a certain index. Yes, at least last quarter month has been pretty much stable at that level. But uh, given that it was it is significantly higher than last fiscal, a uh, stable cost index means that even in quarter four, there will be a bump up in terms of overall escalation over quarter four last year. Okay, so year on year, how much is the uh, rise? Well, close to about 25 to 30 percent would be depending on which micron of wool you're buying, but at a blended level, that would be the escalation impact on wool cost uh, for any boosted player. Okay, so this was 30 percent, I, th I think, for the first half, right? 30 to 35 percent. Uh, that's right, and that's holding now, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the last question. I now hand the conference over to the management for their closing comments. Thank you all for participating in today's earnings call. In case of any further queries, you can please reach out to us. Thanks again.